June 6, 1944. Sweeping onto the Normandy shore, the massed strength of Allied armies lanced forward to crack open Fortress Europe. In this swift, historic moment, two summers after the end, Canadians, sharpened by long preparation, made the central landing. A huge gray armada followed the landing forces across the channel. Munitions, vehicles, reinforcements, all the pumped material to smash open Europe's gateway. And crowding the landing craft were our men, the men who trained at Borden, at Shiloh, at Gordon Head and the Burt, who manned the defenses of Britain in the fateful months after Dunkirk. The first two days of invasion saw the beachheads firmly secured, and now began the drive eastward through France, aimed at the center of Nazi Germany. Rolling inland along the lanes and highways, Canadian armor moved with the British toward Bayeux and Caen, probing, searching out the German units to come to grips with them. Fighting along the streets and hedgerows, the Canadians forced their enemy back to a line outside Caen, where heavy battles developed. By the end of June, the first chapter of invasion had ended. From their initial landings, the Allies had begun to drive inland, and when Cherbourg had fallen to American troops, Swift and powerful drives began to slash deep into France from the peninsula, rolling back the Nazi armies. Overhead, Allied squadrons spread a protecting screen of air power, dovetailing with every step of ground operation. Within a hundred miles of the fighting fronts, no Nazi airfield could launch its fighter planes. Strafing planes scourged the Luftwaffe on the ground, riddled land transport, smashed communications between the weakening links of the German defense. Typhoon and Spitfire squadrons of the RCAF, in savage combat, ran the Nazis' failing fighter strength into the ground. Early in July, Canadians and British launched the devastating barrage that led off to the capture of Caen. Wearing down bitter resistance, Canadians fought through Carpiquet village to outflank Caen itself and punched on ahead, dislodging the Germans from their strongholds around the city. Only the ancient church of Saint Etienne stood unscarred when Caen fell to Canadians and British on July 9th. The people had a heartfelt welcome for our troops grimed with battle. For men like this RCAF sergeant who had parachuted down three months before to work with the French underground. But Caen, like many other towns, had been smashed in the ruinous fighting. Where war passes, there is a toll of civilian lives and wrecked homes, part of the cost that must be reckoned in the huge and detailed operations of invasion. Throughout the Allied advance, new developments of timing, coordination and striking power have been effected by the Supreme Allied Command. The 1st Canadian Army, led by Lieutenant General Harry Quirar, has perfected itself in the new techniques of battle, and war correspondents like Ross Munro have described the story of our fighting men and their operations on the battlefields of France.
One striking instance from Normandy has been the extremely close coordination between Canadian air and ground forces. Pinpoint bombing in support of our tanks, artillery and infantry paved the way for the advance toward Falaise beginning August 8th. After the bombing, Canadians moving by night in armored trucks pierced the German lines in a swift drive to Falaise. With flail-equipped tanks clearing the minefields, troops and armor moved forward in their first big Canadian action as a separate field army. In mid-August, our tanks and infantry entered Palais. Shortly afterward, Canadian and American troops gained contact and locked large elements of the Nazi 7th Army in a relentless vice. The hinge of the German defense line in Normandy was broken. Now the fortress had begun to crumble and decay on every side. Within Germany, there was suffering, revolt, and growing panic. Without, the hammer blows struck by the democracies, whose weakness had so long been preached throughout the Reich. And around the captive stormtroopers and SS corps, who once had stamped across the face of Europe, the world now dissolved in bewilderment and fear. For another kind of army was beating them, a citizen's army of men and women, resolute and cheerful, an army whose discipline did not destroy its soul. An army where military rule could sanction friendly and democratic feeling among all ranks. A new army, well aware of its strength and high spirits, eager to meet and build the future once they had won the war. In towns and villages just restored to freedom, Canadian troops have shared in the excitement of a people whose bonds are broken. They have seen people coming back, faced with the wreckage of their homes and their towns, but starting in to live once more. And even in the wreckage that war has wrought, they have struck up a fast friendship with the French people that will carry over into the years when France is building anew. And in a Normandy village on Bastille Day, July 14th, French-Canadian troops joined with the villagers in a service to honor a reborn France. Thinking ahead the time when all their country would come into the light, they did not dare dream that within six short weeks, New invasions would have landed. Marseille, Toulon, and Bordeaux would be taken, and Paris would be freed by its own citizens. But the fighting is not finished. There are bitter battles ahead. The campaign against the inner fortress of Germany itself. Canadians and Americans and British and free fighting men from every country in Europe are swarming into the great final phase of the battle. Here is the Canadian armor, massing for new drives against the retreating German forces, streaming out to follow and destroy a ruthless enemy now close to the brink of defeat. of Europe, breaking through to the final stronghold. 